Take a minute and walk through kind of the history of federalism and how it's been applied. Of course, we know that in order to decide what the Constitution means, that's the job of the Supreme Court. So we're going to talk about a couple of Supreme Court cases. The first one is McCulloch v. Maryland. Now, this is an 1819 case. John Marshall is the Chief Justice here. This is a case where Maryland um, is trying to tax the Bank of the United States, the Bank of the United States, of course, being the federal bank. And the question is, can a state put a tax on the federal government? And uh, uh, John Marshall <coughs> rules that the government of the United States, though limited in its power, is supreme within its sphere of action. So the government of the United States, in this case, has the right to regulate interstate commerce. Therefore, that right cannot be interfered with uh, by the state governments. And then he explains that the power to tax is interference because, in his words, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And so he rules that, that if the federal government has been given um, an area to operate in, interstate commerce, the state governments cannot interfere in that area. Um, he also incidentally uses the necessary and proper clause here to explain, uh, to establish the federal government's right to create the bank in the first place, going back to a discussion we had in chapter two. There's another case that doesn't make it into, into this uh, PowerPoint. Oh, no, there it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gibbons v. Ogden, 1824. Gibbons v. Ogden is a case where two men have been granted a monopoly to run a ferry across the, let's see, the Hudson River. The Hudson River separates Manhattan from New Jersey. Uh, the state of New York grants one of these guys the, a, a right to run that ferry, and the federal government grants the other one. And they sue each other, claiming that they have a monopoly. Well, the Supreme Court says that because the ferry takes off in one state and lands in the other, um, that's, that's uh, interstate commerce, and therefore the federal government is the only one that has the right to say anything about that. And so, again, this establishes the idea that if it's a federal power, interstate commerce, um, then uh, uh, only the, the, the federal government um, uh, has ultimate authority there. Now, the biggest episode in our discussion of, uh, of federalism is, of course, the Civil War. Uh, when we talk about the judiciary, I'm going to make the argument that there have been so far three great questions in American history. The first of these great questions is, who's supreme? the federal government or the state governments. And there was a lot of argument about this. And, and as I pointed out, people like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams envisioned a world where the state governments were actually the dominant force. Uh, of course, that has changed dramatically over time. And this question over uh, which level of government would be supreme uh, is finally resolved once and for all in the bloodiest possible fashion uh, during the Civil War. The Civil War, of course, it's about slavery. It's about Western expansion. It's about a lot of things. But probably most importantly, uh, from a phil uh, philosophical standpoint, it's about who has the authority, the federal government or the state governments. And because the union wins, the union of course means the federal government, um, uh, this is essentially going to uh, uh, subjugate the states uh, forever. The next major episode we have to talk about is Brown v. Board of Education. And this is really going to um, uh, start to bring into focus the, the right way to think about federalism. In Brown v. Board of, Edu uh, Board of Education, um, the issue was, can states in an area that they're supposed to have control over, education, um, can they discriminate against African Americans? And the federal government, and the Supreme Court in this case, is going to rule uh, that no, they cannot, that the federal government's responsibility to protect the rights of its citizens trumps the state government's ability to run, in this case, their educational system. And here we're going to begin to see even more encroachment by the federal government into the spheres of power of the state governments. Brown v. Board is also really important because after it's issued in 54 and then Brown number 2 in 55, um, nothing changes. Uh, it, it is not enforced. And how it gets enforced is going to lead to probably the most important point we'll make about federalism, but I'll save that for the big finish here in a minute. Federalism also uh, uh, refers to the obligations states have to each other. There's three of these in the Constitution, and so we should point those out. The full faith and credit clause says that any official document from one state has to be recognized by another state. So, for example, if I get a driver's license in Texas, it has to be recognized by another state. Or if I take out a home loan in Texas and then I run away to New Mexico, um, my, the money that I owe the bank is still valid even though it's a Texas document. Uh, this one is, has become really interesting lately because of, of course, uh, gay marriage. Um, for example, right now the, the way this works, well, this is a little bit in flux, but let's say that um, you want to go get gay married in Iowa. 
And so you, where it's legal, and you go up to Iowa, and you, and you have a, a, and two men marry each other. And then you come back to Texas. Texas will not recognize your marriage. Now, the Constitution seems to make it pretty clear that Texas has to recognize your marriage. But in the 1990s, I'm sorry, in the early 2000s, a, a law was passed called the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, Defense of Marriage Act, that says that gay marriage is an exception to the full faith and credit. Now, legal scholars, including now three federal judges, have said this is nonsense. You can't simply pass a law in telling people it's okay to ignore part of the Constitution. And so that's why the whole thing is in flux, is we're kind of waiting for the Supreme Court to weigh in on it. Of course, the Supreme Court is very conservative, so don't be surprised if they um, uphold DOMA. But I can tell you right now, uh, uh, a series of federal court decisions have ruled that the Defense of Marriage Act, saying you don't have to recognize a, a gay marriage from another state, has been thrown out by the courts. Uh, based on the idea of this full faith and credit. The second of these obligations is the Privileges and Immunities Clause. This simply says that there can be no difference in rights between the citizens of, of one state and another. For example, if I was uh, uh, born and raised in Oklahoma, which thank God I wasn't, and I came down to Texas, I could not be given some different set of rights from the government. I have to be treated the same. All citizens of the U.S. have to be treated the same. Now you may say, wait a minute, if I go to an out-of-state college, they charge me more t for tuition. Uh, that's true, but the argument there is, is that the taxes you paid your whole life living in the state uh, basically went to your tuition. So because I've lived in Texas and paid uh, taxes in the state of Texas that have supported the University of Texas, I get a discounted rate when I go there, as opposed to somebody who shows up on, on day one of freshman year who has not contributed to the taxes to pay for the school. So a lot of times students bring that up, and I thought I'd throw that out there. The final one, whoops, click on the mouse, is extradition. Uh, uh, states have to send criminals back to the states that they're uh, uh, accused of, of a crime in. So if you uh, uh, rob a liquor store in Texas and drive to Louisiana, uh, Louisiana is obligated to send you back to Texas. They can't, they can't refuse to send you back. So there goes that plan.